The Fairchild Hiller Corporation's final approach to ATS F&G owes much indeed to the broad and special domains of space technology as it has evolved over the years under the aegis of NASA. This debt undoubtedly will only grow larger. But in our own special ways, we too have carved out certain areas of special expertise within which our top people have had extensive experience in other NASA programs. President Edward Ewell is chairman of the ats g Steering Committee, which meets monthly. It consists of Messrs. Eldon Olson, Vice President of Honeywell, Dr. Edward Miller, General Manager of Philco Ford Space Division, Arthur Cooper, Vice President of IBM, and Dr. Coleman Raphael, Vice President and Manager of Fairchild Hiller's Space and Electronic Systems Division, the division responsible for the ats g program. Reporting directly to Dr. Raphael is ATS Program Director Irvin Singer, who previously directed Fairchild Hiller's CERT II and Project FIRE programs. Reporting to Irv Singer are some of our top space-oriented, space-experienced engineers and managers, men who have spent major portions of their careers in planning and developing some of NASA's most successful programs. Pegasus. Project FIRE and CERT II SSU among them. Beyond this, there has been in-depth association with a number of successful spacecraft subsystems, such as Nimbus-D and the Radio Astronomy Explorer. We have given new meaning to the team concept and have departed from the conventional in developing ideas that contribute to mission success. It is the purpose of this ATS program to provide a stable Earth-oriented spacecraft at synchronous equatorial orbit for experiments to be selected by NASA's Space Science and Application Steering Committee. Apart from these experiments, other specific objectives include the deployment and use of a large parabolic reflector 30 feet in diameter, capable of fine pointing, that will use steerable high-gain beams and will demonstrate interferometer attitude sensing technology. Additionally, the program provides for data relay, a communication subsystem for place, and an instructional television experiment. When separated and fully deployed in orbit, our 2,000-pound spacecraft is 24 feet high. Its reflector is 30 feet in diameter, and tip to tip, its solar array extends 52 feet. Most of the experiments and all of the communications, attitude control, power, telemetering, and command subsystems are packaged within the 54-inch cubed EVM, the Earth Viewing Module. At the top surface of the EVM are located the multiple antenna feeds for the communication subsystem. These feeds are maintained at the focal length of the 30-foot reflector by means of a rigid support truss. When in the launch configuration on the Titan III, the reflector is wrapped in a tight torus-shaped package, and the curved solar panels are stowed, forming a nine-foot cylinder around the EVM truss. Our own responsibilities for systems management, integration, electric power, and the spacecraft structure interlock with those of our subcontractors. Honeywell is responsible for stabilization and control, auxiliary propulsion, and the gravity gradient experiment. IBM is responsible for the telemetry and command subsystem, and for the interferometer. Philco Ford is responsible for the prime focus feed, the communications transponder, and the radio beacon experiment. Putting this ATS system together has been an experience that transcends the purely vocational aspects of the work. Men, ideas, and systems have come to the fore. Configurations have grown and evolved. And in the four years of trial and error, review and evaluation, only the best have prevailed. We have examined every phase of performance, 
reliability, producibility, cost, scheduling factors. We have looked for potential interface problems among subsystems and have modified our design accordingly. To this end, we are suggesting a number of design revisions and innovations that will enhance its performance. Perhaps the most visibly innovative aspect of our approach to ATS is the hemi-cylindrical solar panels. 41,000 solar cells cover 200 square feet of the curved surfaces. This assures a constant 500 watt power output throughout the day, thereby providing the fullest flexibility in conducting our experiments. It gives us a balanced cross-section to solar pressure, important to attitude control. Thus, the spacecraft, as viewed from the sun, presents the same cross-section on both the roll and the yaw axes. Balanced solar pressure, of course, becomes relatively important, since it is essentially the only disturbing force you need stabilize against. Innovational, too, is the prime focus feed. It differs from the baseline design most dramatically, perhaps, in that it does away with the need for a rotating feed and the problems associated with it. Instead of a single line of feeds mounted on a rotating platform tracking two independent satellites simultaneously for the DRS experiment, we propose a fixed cross of feeds. By switching feeds and steering the z-axis in pitch and roll, we can perform the same mission at less cost with greater reliability. To this feed innovation, add the idea of a high-gain VHF antenna, another feature that didn't appear in the original design. The VHF feeds atop the EVN utilize the big reflector to provide some 16 dB of gain at 140 megahertz thus providing a high-gain earth coverage beam. With it, we'll be able to provide voice or special data links between ground stations, Ahmedabad, say, and the ATS control station in Germany, for example. We could also make RFI measurements at VHF. With this antenna, it is feasible to consider direct FM broadcasting over the standard FM band as a possible future experiment for ATSG. In monopulse tracking and a number of other communications facets of ATS, we've once again improved on baseline design. We've eliminated the need for monopulse tracking at UHF by providing monopulse tracking at VHF. There will be no need for new UHF transmitters at NASA's ground stations. VHF will do just as well, the same VHF needed anyway for telemetry. In addition, we provide monopulse tracking at S-band which allows us to perform the data relay satellite experiment with automatic as well as open loop tracking techniques. In open loop tracking, Nimbus or Apollo orbit data is used to control ATS attitude. By closing the loop through S-band monopulse tracking, ATS will be pointing at the signal source rather than at a point in space. Regarding the Earth viewing module, We've proposed changing the basic configuration from the original cylindrical shape to a box shape. This new shape will give much better thermal control because of the greater north and south viewing surfaces. The thermal louvers, placed only on the north-south surfaces where sunlight doesn't fall, except at oblique angles, have temperature-sensitive shutters whose angle of opening will permit more or less radiation to space. Heat pipes in the EVM equipment mounting surfaces will distribute heat evenly by conduction and hold temperature to 20 degrees centigrade plus or minus 10 degrees centigrade, providing uniform temperature throughout. In terms of power supply, we have developed a technique for using series non-dissipative switching mode regulators of recent design, already successfully used in the CERT-2 and AIRLOCK programs. These high-efficiency regulators perform the function of the shunt-type limiters used previously in earlier ATS spacecraft and are particularly suitable for this spacecraft configuration. They enable us to avoid taps on the solar panels and extensive wiring between the panels and the EVM. Their use minimizes cost and improves the reliability and testability of this vital subsystem. Our choice of material for truss stabilizing the EVM and the big reflector is another innovation providing added performance. We found aluminum subject to thermal deflection, 
So we chose instead graphite filament reinforced plastic, GFRP, as the best possible material to cope with the tremendous variations in temperature the spacecraft will encounter. Lighter than aluminum, GFRP has the structural capacity to maintain the precise alignment required between the EVM and the big reflector. So that we and our subcontractors can work simultaneously, we have taken a so-called layered approach. We've modularized the EVM. The top section of the three-section module is the communication subsystem, buildable and testable entirely at Philco Ford. Philco Ford, for instance, can integrate and test its entire communication subsystem in its own module. At the same time, Honeywell will install the attitude control subsystem in the center module. And simultaneously at Fairchild, the interferometer will be installed in the lower module along with the GFE experiments and some additional components that require earth viewing access. This three-layer EVM modularization means lower costs, tighter schedules, and added reliability benefits we'll be grateful for in Phase D. In terms of attitude control, our primary emphasis has been on ensuring performance over a long operating life. As a consequence, every component within the attitude control subsystem is backed up with either a duplicate redundant or functionally redundant component. In some cases, such as the operational controller, which is the heart of the attitude control subsystem, both types of redundancy are provided. Two completely redundant digital controllers are backed up by a simple analog controller capable of supporting most of the mission requirements in the unlikely event that both of the digital controllers were to fail. In addition, a backup mode is provided that is capable of regaining control of even a tumbling satellite using the command telemetry subsystems. Two redundant Polaris star trackers backed up by an inertial reference assembly ensure high reliability for yaw axis control. Similarly, the pitch and roll axis earth sensors are backed up by the monopulse and interferometer as well as the inertial reference assembly. The torquers are also selected with redundancy in mind. The inertial wheels are backed up by an ammonia coal gas thruster system, which is itself fully redundant. This same ammonia supply supports the hot gas thrusters mounted at the CG of the spacecraft for orbit control. The ammonia propulsion system will be assembled, tested, and installed as a sealed unit with no breaks in any of the lines, thus avoiding possible contamination problems. The factory sealed gas system, along with the use of Class C pyrotechnics, allows us to bypass launch site operations in the explosive safe area and instead ship the spacecraft directly to the launch pad. Reliability has high priority with us. Our approach is to design reliability right into the spacecraft. Minimum dependence upon moving parts extensive utilization of flight-proven hardware, extensive analysis of failure and backup modes, judicious use of block and functional redundancy where appropriate, conservative application of derating of electronic components. In fact, the failure of any one component anywhere in the entire system will not cause loss of mission. Accepting only magnetic field measurements, the Fairchild Hiller team has all the facilities needed to manufacture and test the ATS spacecraft. Production, testing, and assembly will be accomplished at Germantown in a single facility designed for the fabrication of spacecraft systems. Its high bay area provides one million cubic feet of well-proportioned working space. A manufacturing and test complex under the same roof allows the accomplishment of many work processes using equipment not usually found in a single facility. A modern machine shop with skill to match provides the in-house control needed for producing an intricate EVM. Electronics gets special consideration in terms of people and fine tools. The largest and the smallest of bonded and honeycomb details for the spacecraft will be manufactured here. 
Unique strippable coatings will protect microelectronics, adding further to the idea of performance and reliability. There is a clean room within the complex with a control particle count well below 10,000 per cubic centimeter. Environmental chambers allow the testing of materials and components under a wide variety of conditions. Shakers range from the very large to the very small, some integral with climatic test chambers. There is adequate room to develop and test other types of spacecraft structures, an area of special expertise for the company. In a facility nearby, the company produces solar arrays that have been used on other programs such as Pegasus and Advanced Nimbus, the Apollo Telescope Mount, ATM, RAE, and the LES series. With design, facilities, and man all in hand, we'll be able to finish the job notwithstanding a tight schedule. We orbited all three Pegasus spacecraft within 29 months, the first within 24 months, even without a prior phase BC program. This design offers inherent potentials for upgrading operational capability and performance. It is not overly complex and allows for untimed delivery. It allows flexibility in subcontracting and offers practical solutions to problems other spacecraft have experienced in the past. We've established realistic costs and schedules. We've spent four years consolidating this effort into a single team concept to the point almost where we and our subcontractors sometimes lose sight of the fact that different companies are involved. Beyond design and facilities, there are the curious, the interested, and the inventive. Engineers who can reach a final design with confidence. Test people who understand the spacecraft environment and mission. A management that has high regard for the ability of others and a track record of its own in the development of modern space tools. Together, they represent an understanding of NASA's goals and an appreciation of the task at hand. Herb Singer, as Fairchild Hiller's ATS F&G program manager, has organized the unusual in experience, facilities, skill, and people. A most reasonable solution to the success of this space mission. Thank <laughs> you.